Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Phil Gilmartin. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science, and uh, I'd like to welcome you tonight to our inaugural lecture. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce Professor Koch van Oosterhout, who's going to give uh, his inaugural lecture this evening. Koch started out studying biology at Leiden University in the Netherlands in the late 1980s. On graduating, he spent a year researching stingless bees in Costa Rica. He then moved back to Leiden to begin a PhD project focusing on, focusing on the population fragmentation of butterflies. In 1998, he moved to the University of Hull here in the UK to study the molecular ecology of the guppy, or the rainbow fish, one of the world's most widely distributed tropical fish species. In 2001, based on the work that he'd done, he was awarded an NERC fellowship, which enabled him to develop a model system for conservation genetics based on his research into guppies. His research for this project took him to Trinidad and Tobago and Lake Malawi. Koch became a lecturer at the University of Hull in 2005, staying there for another six years before he moved here to UEA to take up the position of reader in evolutionary genetics in 2011. His current post is funded by ELSA, the Earth and Life Systems Alliance, a group formed of scientists from across the Norwich Research Park, including the John Innes Centre, the Sainsbury Laboratory, and the Genome Analysis Centre. At UEA, Koch is now working with collaborators from across ELSA, investigating the evolution genetics of organisms, organisms such as diatoms, the pink pigeon, other endangered bird species, and also, I know from our own collaboration, work on, uh, on heteromorphic flower development in Primula. He also continues to research into guppies and their parasites, and the parasites and pathogens of plants, including urmycetes and aphids. Since his arrival in Norwich, Koch has published over 40 academic papers and released computer software to aid the analysis of genetic and genomic data. As you'll discover this evening, his research focuses on evolution. By examining genetics and epigenetics, he aims to understand how species and populations can adapt to changes in biotic and abiotic environments. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to all the visitors to the university this evening, and will now ask Professor Koch van Oosterhout to present his inaugural lecture. Koch. Thank you very much, uh, Phil, and thank you very much for coming over here. So today I will talk about evolution and what does it take. So why study evolution? Is evolution not all old hat, things that happened in the past? Well, not really. With global environmental change, species are uh, forced to adapt or evolve. Global change, including uh, uh, warming of the climate, uh, pollution, uh, species uh, which are uh, pathogens, they are challenging currently populations and species to adapt and they force them to respond to these environmental changes. There's also, of course, um, evolution happening in, in around us, like in hospitals, the superbug evolution of um, bacteria that are resistant against, uh, against uh, antibiotics, and the resistance breaking of uh, uh, pathogens, such as crop pathogens, every year that challenges food security. However, not all uh, species can really adapt. And indeed, there's a lot of um, extinctions of vertebrates and other animals which have um, uh, caused a global, a global uh, reduction in biodiversity. So by studying evolution, we can, we can start to learn and understand what makes species be able to adapt to these environmental changes and why some species are going extinct. Now, the theory of evolution will also benefit from a really rich history of over 150 years of um, research, starting from Lamarck and Darwin, uh, population geneticists. They have developed a really rich framework of population genetic theory and evolutionary genetic theory, uh, which we can build on now. And particularly now with the development of new technologies, next generation sequencing, uh, which generates so much data we can challenge and understand uh, evolution much better, test these new theories, and indeed add to them. Uh, 
Currently, with uh, next generation sequencing technologies, the, the, the data doubling time is about five months. It's, it's five, every five months, the, the price to sequence a single base halves, which is uh, faster than Moore's law for the, 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 the speed of computer science. So we have a vast amount of data, which is uh, often stored on, uh, on cloud computers and analyzed. And of course, that gives us a lot of uh, data to, to work with and test evolutionary theories. So let me give you a very brief history about um, the study of evolution. It started with, um, really with Lamarck, who proposed that species were not um, stationary, but that they could in fact change over time. And this, of course, is the hallmark of evolution, the, the fact that, that species can change. And this went against the, the religious dogmas of the time. Darwin and Wallace uh, introduced the concept of natural selection, and that, of course, introduced adaptive evolutionary change. Mendel, the founder of uh, modern genetics, uh, experimented with 25,000 pea plants, making crosses, really understanding the genetic basis of inheritance. These, these theories, or this, this knowledge, was largely forgotten for 30 years, uh, until it was discovered by Hugo de Vries, and worked on by Bateson and many others, Right, Fisher, um, and they developed a really rich conservation or co population genetic framework uh, that is really the foundation of evolution as it is as we know it today and uh, provides a very strong basis to test uh, evolutionary principles. Uh, after that, the DNA hub double helix in the 1950s, Sanger sequencing in the 1970s, uh, PCR in the 1980s, and now a next generation sequencing with vast amount of data being generated from many, many species. So what do we know really about evolution? Well, we know there are five evolutionary forces. Three of them are creative. They create diversity. Mutation, that is really the origin of all genetic variation, uh, that generates variation over time uh, by changing the genetic code. Recombination is a force that shuffles this variation around and can do it at different levels, for example, between individuals or within genomes, or even between the genomes of different individuals or different species. Gene flow is a mechanism such as migration, where um, individuals are changing from one population to the other. So it, is, it exchanges genetic variation across gene pools from different populations. Now, all this variation that is basically generated this way is is substrate for natural selection. And this is molded and leads to adaptive evolution. Then there's one more force, genetic drift, and that is a force that is neutral. It is an, a random change in allele frequencies and gene frequencies uh, just by chance. This plays a role particularly in small populations, uh, for example, due to bottlenecks. And this is also very important for that reason in uh, conservation genetics, where population sizes are typically small. Now, so how can you study these evolutionary forces? Well, one of the problems or one of the challenges really is that you can't see an evolutionary force. You can only see the, the, the result. It's like gravity. You can't see that gravity is here, but you can see the effects of gravity. Um, so with the evolutionary forces, they leave an imprint on the genome or the transcriptome or the methylome, and that is what we study. And in fact, what we study is typically the interaction between those evolutionary forces. So we look, for example, between selection and, and drift or mutation and recombination. And a lot of the uh, statistics which have been developed um, are expressing the equilibrium state between those different forces. So many evolutionary uh, terminology expresses also these type of, this type of interplay. Like, for example, Red Queen's arms race between host and parasite or genetic hitchhiking. Those are terms that capture the interaction between different evolutionary forces. Now, let me focus a little bit here on recombination, because recombination generates a huge amount of variation very rapidly. And uh, it's an important driver of adaptive evolution. Recombination can happen between, uh, at different levels. It can happen uh, at homologous genes, the same genes in different organisms. And this is really the reason that sex has evolved. It's the, it allows the exchange of, uh, of variation between individuals and makes that the offspring are different from that of the parents. 
It can also, uh, recombination can also happen between paralogous genes or gene duplicates. And this is, for example, gene conversion. And lots of genes are in multi-gene families where variation can be exchanged between the copies of the different genes. Recombination can also happen between different species or between different genera. Uh, and in that case, you talk about hybridization or horizontal gene transfer. Now, hybridization is rare, it's once in a blue moon event, but it's really significant in evolution. Take, for example, the human genome. It consists of about 23,000 or so genes. If each of those genes had just two alleles each, the number of recombinants it could, uh, and new genotypes it could generate is that number there, 10 to the well, 11,000 almost. That's an astronomically large number. In fact, astronomically doesn't quite capture it because there's only 10 to the 25th or so stars in the visible universe. This is a really huge number. Recombination makes a lot of substrate for natural selection to act on, and this is why it is an important, uh, important force. Now, one of the kind of holy grails in, in evolutionary uh, research is, of course, understanding the origin of species. Now, one of the perhaps most uh, charismatic um, uh, radiations is that of the of the Darwin of Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. There are 15 finches uh, which have distinct big, sh big shapes, which have evolved to exploit different uh, food sources. Now, in comparison, there are about eight, 800 or maybe closer than than, than a thousand uh, cichlids who have radiated in about four million years' time which is an evolutionary wink of an eye. It's a very, very rapid uh, rate of evolution. These fish are very, very different from each other, really large morphological differences. So this is, in fact, the fastest radiation of, of vertebrates on Earth. And it happened in uh, the, big, the big lakes of, uh, of Malawi, uh, Lake Tanganyika and Victoria. And this inspired many speciation theories uh, about pharyngeal jaws, which are uh, a second pair of jaws that fish have, or cichlid fish have, uh, which allows them to process food. Uh, there's also a lot of models about speciation, uh, sympatrically or allopatrically, parapatrically. Lots of different uh, speciation theories have been developed based on these observations. Um, but my money is really on hybrid speciation. And the reason I will tell you uh, is now. So we studied, and this is a, um, uh, a study which we uh, published recently in uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society, uh, together with Paul Nichols and Domino Joyce from uh, the University of Hull and Martin Jenner, now at Bristol. So this is a study on um, uh, a river cichlid, Astotilapia calyptra, uh, which uh, lives in the rivers around Lake Malawi. What we wanted to know is whether hybridization of these, of these uh, different river fish uh, created morphological no novelty. For this, we sampled uh, around Lake Malawi and we sequenced uh, mtDNA genes. Now, mtDNA is, is a very good marker to uh, trace back the ancestry of individuals because unlike nuclear genes, it doesn't recombine. So you can uh, find out without the, the problems of recombination, find out where sequences originate from. Now, what we found is that there are two distinct haplotypes, a northern haplotype, the red haplotype, and a southern haplotype, the blue. What we also found is that there was a population in Liwonde, which is the yellow, uh, the yellow bit there, uh, that showed two, both haplotypes occurring in the same population. So, we want to know then now whether that population hybridization would indeed occur between those different haplotypes. And we conducted a microsatellite study uh, looking at nuclear DNA, which does recombine. And we found indeed that that population had admixed genotypes. So basically the two fish from both populations, from both different mitochondrial lineages, were freely hybridizing in this environment. So what we did next, and this really is kind of the crux of this experiment, we crossed these species, these two fish uh, fishes in the laboratory back in Hull. And what we looked for was transgressive segregation. Now, transgressive segregation is a term that captures the, ver the additional variation which is generated when two species are hybridizing, 
and when the variation of the hybrid offspring is more than that of the, of the parents. So it's the additional variation that's generated after hybridization. So over here what you see is um, some of the results. Um, in blue you see the, uh, and red are the, um, the phenotypes of the, of the parents, and these are relative warp scores. So this is basically the, the, the morphology pictured on a two-dimensional scale. What you see is that the red and the blue are largely overlapping, but what you also see, and that's the most remarkable observation, is that the offspring, the F2 offspring, has a much larger phenotypic variation. In fact, for some traits, more than 90% of variation was generated additional to that of the, of the parents. So this is extra variation, which is now substrate for natural selection, where natural selection can act on. So our model of this, this uh, hybrid speciation in this cichlid uh, has three phases. So what we believe has happened is that the river cichlids of the Calyptras have diverged in the, in the rivers over millions of years and diverged genetically. However, morphologically, these fish remain very similar. In fact, it's very difficult to recognize the two, uh, the two fish from the, from the red and the blue clade from the north and the south by, um, uh, just by visual. Uh, visual aids. So morphology has been really conserved and uh, that is due to stabilizing selection because both fish live in a similar environment, a riverine environment. Now the result of this is that <coughs> mutations that may increase a trade value, say by a unit, only when they are compensated for by other mutations that reduce it, also by one unit, only those sets of mutations are maintained in the genome. If there is too many plus mutations, the fish would be too large for the trait. If there's too many minus mutations, the, fi the fish, the trait would be too small. So you see there is a complementation of the two types of mutations. But of course, these two processes happen in the two different uh, populations, the two different gene pools, separately. So both lineages accumulated different plus and minus mutations. Now in the second stage, when the Lake Malawi was formed, it filled, of course, with the river water and with the fish. And this created a secondary contact zone where the fish were allowed to hybridize. Now, as we've seen from the laboratory experiments, this induced evolutionary novelty, morphological novelty, on which was the substrate for natural selection. In this new lake habitat, new habitats started to emerge. And because this fish was now had a lot of evolutionary potential to exploit those new niches, they evolved different phenotypes. And this really is what we believe is the origin of the species uh, due to, um, due to the, the uh, addition of evolutionary novelty by hybridization. And we believe this might be the explanation for this biggest radiation of vertebrates. Now, hybridization is not only happening in fish, it also happens in, in crops, crop pathogens. In particular, the pathogens are uh, the subject of this part of the talk. Agriculture systems are not in evolutionary equilibrium. And they, are, they tend to exist of genetically uniform crops, which are, in evolutionary terms, kind of sitting ducks uh, in the evolutionary arms race with pathogens. Uh, if a pathogen can break the resistance of one host plant, it can break the resistance of them all, <coughs> because they're all genetically identical. Now, similar to the fish, pathogen evolution is really accelerated by hybridization. So this could result in host rate expansion and potentially threaten food security. Now this was the subject we studied together with Jonathan Jones um, studying an oomycete, uh, albugo candida. This is a study which is published uh, recently in eLife by Macmillan and all. So what we did, we looked at this particular um, uh, fungus, fungus like oomycete, which probably you, you better know as a rust fungus and which can cause several diseases like uh, potato blight, sudden oak death, but it can also infect broccoli in your back garden. Now, there's a particular genus in, of oomycetes called albugo, and this, this genus uh, consists mainly of specialists. So with that I mean that they, that they specialize on a single or very few different host plant species. However, this particular species, which is the subject of our investigation, Albugo candida, infects over 200 different host plant species from 63 genera 
from three different plant families. So it has a huge range of different host plants. Now this is, this is remarkable, because how does a generalist evolve really? So that was the question we want to answer here. So in order to, to do this, uh, we sequenced the genome of five different isolates from different host plants, four different host plant species. We assembled the genome uh, of, the, um, of this uh, uh, species, 33 uh, million base pairs, which is about 70% of the genome. And what we detected were three distinct host species. And these three host species were diverged by approximately 1% which is similar or approximately similar as the divergence between uh, humans and chimpanzees. Now, let me make it simple and say there are the blue, the green and the red rays. Now, what we found here is that when you looked at the phylogenies, depending on which gene you made the phylogeny for, the gene tree, you could uh, group the, the species in different ways. Sometimes the blue rays was more similar to the green rays and sometimes the blue was more similar to the red, or the red and the green were more similar to each other. So this resulted in a very confused picture, and this is typical for, for um, recombination or for hybridization. So what we uh, then did, and this is work together with Ben Ward, a PhD student uh, in my group, um, we developed a software, HybridCheck, which was actually released today, or the, the publication was released today, Molecular Ecology Resources, which allowed us to analyze the genome uh, and look for the signal of recombination, or rather for hybridization. Now, this is what it showed. So, over here you have the red, the green, and the blue rays. And what you can see is that sometimes the blue, let me see if this works, no, the, the red and the, and the green share parts of their sequence similar. So, on the, on the, uh, on the length, is the sequence uh, base. It's about 400,000 base pairs, this, uh, this part of the sequence. And where the two, uh, the two bars have the same color, for example yellow, in those areas the two sequences are identical or nearly identical to each other. But similarly, sometimes the blue and the green rays are similar. So of course when, when you see a an, um, an, uh, turquoise area, that is an area where the blue and the green rays are very similar to each other. So what, what this shows is a real mosaic-like genome. It appears that these, these races have exchanged part of their genome with one another. Now, with the software, you can also estimate uh, the age when this happened, based on the nucleotide divergence of those regions. And this showed that introgression or hybridization occurred over a long time span. Some, some events happened really recently, a few hundred years back. Others were dated back hundreds of thousands of years back. So this is an ongoing evolutionary process in which the different races, specialized to different hosts, can exchange part of their uh, genome. Now, what we also found is that the isolates, um, the two isolates of each race were nearly identical. And uh, all the analysis we did suggested that the isolates were really clonally reproducing. So after hybridization, there is, a, there is a fast expansion of the population through clonal reproduction. So, in order to understand a bit more about the biology of this, uh, of this oomycete, uh, we conducted serial infection experiments, and this showed that the infection by an adapted race, which is specialized on that particular host plant, suppresses the host immunity. So what, what uh, this results in is that it suppresses host immunity and it allows other pathogens to, um, to colonize and parasitize this, this host plant. Basically, it creates secondary contact zones that allows for the genetic exchange between those races. So this generalist, and a generalist I use, use very loosely here, this generalist cheats the Red Queen's arms race, which is typically between a single host and a single pathogen. And rather than waiting for a mutation to happen, uh, genetic exchange of between races facilitates uh, really rapid evolution. And of course, by doing this, these, these interregressed regions, these regions which, have, which, already, uh, which are exchanged, have already been tested and tried by evolution. They're already working in one particular host plant. 
So this is a very efficient way of, um, of adaptive evolution and makes it also a very, very uh, uh, powerful evolutionary organism. It can really explain why this, this particular species can infect uh, over 200 uh, host plant species. Now, let me talk a little bit about conservation genetics. This is a subject which is close to my heart. Um, and it's a very important subject to study as an evolutionary biologist uh, because so many species are threatened. Um, particularly small island populations are uh, currently under, uh, under risk. Um, and a lot of extinctions have happened, uh, particularly there, of um, island bird populations. So what we studied was the uh, pink pigeon. Now the pink pigeon is, an, uh, is an, uh, native to Mauritius, which is uh, near the coast of, uh, of uh, Madagascar. And it's very closely related to the dodo. Uh, it's in the same family. Now, unlike the dodo, uh, this pigeon, and this tickled me when I read it, this, tickled, this, this pigeon is not as, um, as palatable, apparently. The species has a bad reputation from a culinary point of view, according to uh, Captain Mainzersagen from the Royal Fusilius. <coughs> so this might be one of the reasons this, uh, this pigeon managed to, uh, to survive. However, it did have some problems, um, and in fact it went through a severe bottleneck. Um, in the 1980s, only 12 birds survived in the wild, and uh, since then it made a remarkable recovery to about, say, approximately 400 birds uh, currently. Now, this, made the, uh, this, this recovery made the IUCN, the conservation um, uh, organization, downlist the species from critically endangered to endangered in 2006. However, the loss of variation after a bottleneck is not immediate. This takes time to, to see. Um, there's other things which are worrying, and one of the things is that there's a significant uh, male sex, male biased sex ratio. Uh, there's high infertility, and uh, this, this bird species also troubled by large uh, infectious diseases, infectious diseases, particularly uh, trichomonas, which kills birds. So in collaboration with the Genome Analysis Center, uh, we did an, uh, a study sequencing 180 or so birds from five different populations in Mauritius. And we asked the following questions. So what is the rate of inbreeding and the genetic differentiation between the different populations? And does inbreeding really affect fitness? Are there SNPs associated to fitness? Can we find particular variants in the genome that uh, convert a high or low fitness? Um, what is the cause of the sex ratio distortion? And of course, most importantly, what can we do? How can we save this species? Now, the first thing we, we found is that the loss of um, heterozygosity, which is a measure of gene diversity, is continuing. So even though the species have recovered in, in size, there is a continuous loss of genetic variation. In fact, when you compare the heterozygosity or gene diversity between parents and their offspring, there is such a large reduction that the effective population size based on this reduction is less than 10, it's about 7.6. So this is a number far, far, far smaller than the 400, uh, which, uh, is, which is the living number of, uh, of birds. What we also found, and this is consistent with genetic drift, is that there is an increase of genetic divergence between the different populations. So the different populations in Mauritius are fixing different uh, alleles and they're losing other alleles. And this causes the, the populations to diverge from one another. Another point what we, what we looked at is whether trichomonas um, how trichomonas is affected by, or how heterozygosity affects the susceptibility of birds to this trichomonas infection. About 50% of birds at any point in time are infected by this parasite, and it accounts for about two thirds of all deaths in, uh, in, in birds in the wild. Now, what we, what we show here is that the observed gene-wide di gene diversity, the genome-wide diversity, the heterozygosity, is significantly explaining variation in the percentage infected birds. With other words, birds which have a high level of gene diversity are significantly less infected than individuals with a low diversity. 
We also did analysis on uh, fertility and fecundity. However, those showed that there was no association between genome-wide heterozygosity and, and fecundity. And this suggests that the, it is not a genome-wide effect, but there are particular genes which are affecting uh, these traits. So what we then did, we conducted a GBAS analysis um, to locate the SNP or SNPs associated to fitness. So we looked for the variants in the genome which are associated to fitness. Now, this over here, I, what I show you is a Manhattan plot. And this shows that there, are, that there is at least one SNP that is strongly associated to the number of eggs being laid per day per female. So there's a particular genetic variant in the genome that we, can, that we know affects the, 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 the fitness or the, the egg laying capacity of female birds. And when we did a uh, further uh, study into this, it was quite close to the pro progesterone uh, receptor gene, which is also known in chickens to affect sex ratio. So we need to, to uh, analyze this further to see what the exact uh, effects are of this, of this gene uh, in the pink pigeon. So, based on this data, we can now make a conservation management plan to try to, to rescue this, this bird. Well, first of all, the first important thing is that we need to upgrade it from an endangered status to critically endangered status on the IUCN red list, because the affected population size is really very, very small. The other important thing to do almost immediately is to look into the translocation of birds between the different uh, populations. Because this helps to convert the variation of genetic variation that is fixed in the different population and, and convert it back into heterozygosity. And this is important because we can show, we have shown that heterozygosity explains so much variation in fitness. Now in stage two what we like to do is we like to sequence museum samples um, and establish what is the variation present in the genome in the past. We have now uh, from the National History Museum uh, samples from the 1960s, from the, sorry, from the 1860s of these birds, so long before the bottleneck, uh, and we are sequencing those in TGAC. And with this analysis, we, can, we will be able to establish where genetic variation in this genome has been lost. And then we can also, with samples from feathers from zoos, in America and in Europe, which we have also uh, obtained, we can screen the pink pigeons in, the, in zoo populations to find out which individuals have favorable mutations. And that can, could, for example, be the progesterone uh, receptor gene or other genes which are high in variation in the ancestral population. Now in stage three, uh, what we need to do is we need to look into the supplementation, genetic supplementation of the wild population with variation of, of birds still present in the zoos. And of course, we also can then inform captive breeding uh, protocols to, to inform them which birds to use in their breeding, because those are the birds which possess uh, valuable genetic variants. Now, the last part of my talk, uh, I will talk about uh, the evolution of a clone, and this is uh, a rather remarkable story. It's about a green peach aphid, Mysis persicae, and it's an, uh, an organism that can colonize 400 or so different host plants. It has evolved resistance to 70 or more different synthetic compounds, which are uh, insecticides, and has done so in the last 50, 50 years. It's the world's most insect-resistant pest. Now, that's, that's quite remarkable, but it's even more remarkable if you realize that this, all this evolution has taken place by genetically identical clones. This organism doesn't have sex, or at least it can, uh, can su sustain in population without having sex and without um, uh, and by clone reproduction. So the question now is, how can evolution take place without genetic change? Now just to illustrate you, um, this is the population uh, distribution of clones in the UK. Um, and what you can see is that clone O, that's the clone we're working with now, has, has colonized and taken over uh, the UK since uh, 2006. It's the dominant clone in the UK. And has, uh, so all the individuals of this species are genetically nearly identical. So we received an, uh, a grant from the BBSRC, uh, basically 
uh, addressing the question, how can the species evolve? And the hypothesis we want to test is, well, M. persicae, the uh, Mysis persicae, possesses a large genetic toolbox of duplicated genes, which it can upregulate and downregulate depending on the environmental conditions it finds itself. So, to, do, to test this, we had two uh, clear objectives. The first was to sequence this genome and compare it to that of a specialist genome, which is uh, quite closely related, A. Pisum. And the second objective was to uh, conduct an experimental evolution in the lab and to test how fast can it evolve to new host plants. So genetically identical individuals, how fast can they evolve to a new host plant and what does, it, what does it involve really? Do they express different genes and how does that affect their fitness? Now, the first result we found was that unlike what we predicted, the specialist had more genes, had a higher gene number than the generalist. So the generalist, in fact, had uh, much fewer gene family expansions and more contractions than the generalist. So this is opposite to what we expected, that they had a large genome of duplicated genes. You can also see this in this Venn diagram. The specialist has over 7,000 uh, genes which are unique to itself and the generalist uh, over 2,000. Also, when you look at particular gene families, you can see that the, the generalist has fewer expansions than the, than the specialist. Now, we talk about uh, the experimental evolution, which is an uh, experiment uh, conducted by Yasu Chen in John Innes Center. Um, what Yasu has done is he has taken the uh, population of M. persicae and put them on two different host plants. So genetically identical individuals putting them on different host plants, and then we looked at the gene expression of those individuals. And the question we want to answer is, does gene expression of these clones differ depending on the host plant? Now, this is the first result, and these are really results which have come uh, out the last, uh, last couple of months. So, of about 170 or so genes that are differentially expressed, most of them, 126, belong to gene families. And here, this is, a, this is a graph. On the y-axis, you see the amount of upregulation of genes um, and points which are colored, not gray, show genes which are significantly upregulated. So these are genes which are more strongly upregulated on one host plant compared to the next. Now, what we can see here is that uh, particularly catepsin B seems to be upregulated on B rapa, the, the brassica. So this gene seems to be upregulated when, it's, when the individuals uh, parasitize this host. Conversely, uh, on the other host plant, Benthiyama, the uh, cuticular protein is being upregulated. So clearly there is differential expression of, this, of these uh, uh, clones on the different host. But now we need to know, does this differential expression also affect fitness? Are these uh, differentially expressed genes unique to aphids, does that make them such a uh, specialist? So to, to analyze this question, we focused on the cathepsin B gene, because that was the gene which this analysis identified as being differentially expressed. And we compared this gene uh, against uh, uh, genes in other, gene, in other insects. So we made a phylogeny, and what this shows is that the cathepsin B gene of, uh, of aphids has a lineage-specific expansion. So, particularly in aphids, this gene family is expanded. Interesting also, the uh, other uh, insect species, uh, and spider mite, shows also a lineage-specific uh, lineage expansion, and this is a sap-feeding insect. So perhaps this is something which is uh, more common in evolution. What we also found is that these genes are in tandem next to each other on the, in, on the chromosome. So they are they are all upregulated synchronously and by some kind of master switch, and they are lying together next to each other on the chromosome. Now, the key question, of course, now is to, to see what happens if these, these upregulated genes, if you silence them again. Does that affect the fitness? Because that would then really be a causal effect. So we did this uh, on, um, by transferring uh, the aphids to Arapidopsis, 
and silencing them, silencing these genes. Now, the left, uh, left part of the graph, you can see that the silencing indeed works. The expression uh, reduced by uh, about a half. And what you can see in the, in the right part of the graph is that the, uh, the fitness expressed as the number of nymphs, number of offspring the, um, the, the, the silenced lines produced, was significantly reduced. So this clearly shows that by silencing these genes, we can reduce the fitness, or with other words, the upregulation of these genes really increase the fitness. This is an adaptive response. Now, the next part of the, of, the, um, of the research will focus on identifying how are these genes upregulated. And this is something we are working on now. I can't tell you any, any details yet. But of course, what would be ideal is to find the, the, the exact master switch, which allows this upregulation of a tandem array of genes and which increases the fitness. So, let me wrap this up. So, what I've been talking about is cichlid radiation in Lake Malawi, uh, showing how hybridization can really uh, spur it on speciation. And uh, we've talked about uh, the evolution of a generalist, again, through hybridization, the exchange of, um, of uh, genetic information through, uh, by different races. The pink pigeon, uh, how conservation genomics can really uh, inform um, and uh, the conservation management of this bird. And uh, perhaps most remarkably, the, the clonal aphids, uh, Mises persicae, how rapid evolution can take place without genetic change. So, uh, rest me to say that study of evolution itself is still very much evolving. It's a very dynamic field. And I think that in the, in the next few years there will be some new chapters to be written and added to the textbooks. Thank you very much. And also thank you to all my collaborators, which have been really wonderful. Thank you.